Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery where today I want to share the story of the unsolved murder of Peggy Hetrick. Peggy's case was considered solved for a brief period, somebody was charged and convicted back in 1999 but the sentence was vacated in 2008 when DNA evidence indicated that the man arrested probably wasn't the one responsible. So who was? This is one of the oldest and most infamous unsolved cases in Colorado's history, out of over 1,300 unsolved murders statewide, according to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. Peggy Hetrick was born in Lovell, Wyoming on the 1st of March 1949. She was a white female with blue eyes and red hair, 5 foot 2, about 115 pounds, so a fairly petite woman. She seemed to be someone who lived quite a quiet but interesting life, especially as a child. She lived for a number of years as a kid on an airbase on the Mediterranean coast of North Africa, in Tripoli, Libya, because her dad worked for an oil company. This is where she graduated from Wheelers High School in 1967. Her classmates remember her as fun, vivacious and well-liked. She was considered one of the popular girls, she was cool. From there, she went on to attend Arizona State University, then moved to Loveland, Colorado in the mid-70s where she cared for her mother who was terminally ill with cancer she soon died. And so in 1978, Peggy moved to Fort Collins in northern Colorado, where she worked as the accessories manager at a store called The Fashion Bar, which was a clothing store in the square, one of the main shopping destinations of Fort Collins at the time. She had an on-again, off-again boyfriend called Matt Zollner. She dated in between being on with him. Peggy loved to read, being a frequent visitor at a local library, and her dreams of one day writing her own novel. According to those who knew her, Peggy always had a smile on her face and she was just a really nice person. She didn't own a car and would often walk around alone at night but didn't think much of it as she lived in Fort Collins, which was a much smaller city back in the 80s as it is now. The 1990 census shows a population of about 87,000 compared to 170,000 in 2019. It was considered much safer back then. And it probably helped as well that Peggy was a pretty fearless woman, probably due to her childhood moving all around the world. She didn't care at all about walking on her own in the dark. Peggy would walk everywhere, between her job and home, between her home and the neighbourhood bars, and it was likely that she was on one of these walks when she was attacked. She left work just after 9pm on Tuesday, February 10th, 1987, and walked home without incident, but upon arrival found herself locked out of her own apartment. She'd loaned her keys to a woman, a temporary roommate of sort, called Sharon DeConnick, who was staying at the apartment with her whilst Peggy's usual roommate was out of town. It turns out that Sharon had gone to the bar that evening, down several drinks, gone back to the apartment, crawled into bed, and was just out for the count. No matter how much Peggy tried to wake her up, she just couldn't. So for the next few hours, Peggy wanders between her local bars, first going to the Laughing Dog Saloon and then the Prime Minister Pub and Grill, which was her regular haunt, every so often calling her apartment to see if she could get an answer, which she finally does around midnight. So Peggy heads home to change and then continues back to the bars for her night out. She goes back to the Prime Minister where she runs into that on-again, off-again boyfriend, Matt Zollner. He's there with another woman, but they seem to be on good terms, they hug and they have a catch-up. He even offered her a ride home at one point, at first she said no, and then she eventually accepted, so Matt heads to the loo before they leave. But when he returns, he sees her leaving alone, about quarter past one in the morning on February 11th. That was the last time anyone confirmed seeing her alive. There are people who reported potentially seeing a woman off Peggy's description in the car park having a smoke around this time, and there was a small pile of cigarettes matching her usual brand found there, so that may have actually been her. It is worth noting there are a few different accounts of Peggy's movements on the night she died, but this is the timeline I could put together that seemed to make the most sense. Her body wouldn't be found for another six hours, at about 7am spotted by a cyclist called Linwood Hodgson. He was on his way to work when he cycled past an empty field in southern Fort Collins at the 3500 block of Landings Drive, less than 500 yards from the Prime Minister where she'd last been seen. As commonly happens, this man assumed that the pale white body was a mannequin at first, at least until he saw the blood poured along the curb and a trail of blood out into the field. There was a single half-smoked cigarette just lying in this pool of blood. The drag trail of the blood started at the curb and changed direction multiple times. The killer clearly tried to decide where best to dump her body. This cyclist didn't hesitate to cycle back to his friend's house from which he'd came to contact the authorities, who quickly descended down on the scene along with the local media. 
Bodies didn't often just turn up in Fort Collins, it was a safe place to live. You would never second guess walking around this area on your own until Peggy Hetrick. Peggy's body was found face up and partially dressed, her red hair fanned out in the dirt and her eyes open. Her shirt and jacket had been pushed up past her chest and her trousers had been pulled down, her handbag slung over her shoulder. From an initial look, it looked like her only injury was that her left nipple had been cut off incredibly neatly. The coroner said that procedures such as this would not have been difficult for someone like himself, someone medically trained to complete, and it would have required less than a minute. There was also found to be damage to her genitals, which later confirmed to be something akin to female circumcision. One doctor later described it as a partial vulvectomy, a procedure that once again requires high skill and good quality surgical equipment to perform. Both cuts were definitely done after her death. Only upon moving her body did they discover the cause of her death though, a single knife wound in her back near her left scapula. It was 35mm in length and 2mm in width. On the blunt edge of the knife wound there was a tear, indicating that the knife used may have had an irregularity like a sore edge, or perhaps it was caused by a twisting motion from the killer. This knife wound penetrated Peggy's chest cavity and the left lung, the particular area in the left lung that houses all of the blood vessels. This would have very quickly caused massive blood loss as Peggy's chest cavity slowly filled with blood and it would have spilled out of the wound, but a lot of it would have been absorbed by the coat she was wearing, so it's unlikely that the killer would have been covered in blood as a result. She was stabbed with such force that the knife splintered one of the ribs on her left side and she lost so much blood that the coroner couldn't even perform a blood alcohol test but they did take some vitreous fluid from her eye and determined that she was indeed drunk, but just slightly above the legal limit to drive. She wasn't blackout drunk when she died. It was also noted that Peggy had several abrasions on her right cheek from her chin towards the top of her head. There was also a small abrasion on her right ring finger, which the coroner determined happened before her death. But these were not thought to be defensive wounds. It's likely that Peggy didn't know she was being attacked until it was too late. The time for death was simply said to be in the early morning hours of February 11th. They couldn't say anything more specific than that, but she would have died very quickly, within minutes of being stabbed due to the blood loss. It was soon clear that Peggy's murder wasn't a result of a robbery gone wrong. Her handbag still had all of her things inside, over 50 items in total. I don't know why, but that small fact just really hit me. I'm sure so many of you can relate to your bags just being overrun with items, all accumulated at the bottom. It's so easy to brush over the fact that these victims of crimes were once real, living, breathing human beings leading full, fulfilling lives. Peggy was a woman with a complicated love life, going out drinking after a long day at work. She was chronically broke. She chose to spend her money on her Christmas party over the Christmas season instead of saving it. And she had a handbag full of bits and bobs, as we all do. According to Denver Post, they found nail polish, lipstick, a Tide coupon, a pencil, checkbook, $2.47, three packs of cigarettes, a library book, receipts, a matchbook, and her passport. It was through this passport they were later able to identify her. So not long after she was found, the police turned up at the apartment, which was less than a mile away. 26-year-old Sharon DeConnick answered the door and Sharon told the police what she could about Peggy. She said who she usually hung out with, her usual routine, specifically the men that she hung out with. Sharon was familiar with Matt, the on-again, off-again boyfriend, and another guy that Peggy had been periodically dating, but she also mentioned a man called Derek that Peggy had recently met at the Laughing Dog Saloon. Police soon also interviewed Peggy's regular roommate, Barb Kohler, who'd been in California at the time, and Barb also spoke of a man called Derek who Peggy had met at the Laughing Dog, saying that she thought of him as still being a real kid, and that he told her that he was planning on living in a tent with a friend of his. Peggy was 37 years old at the time she died and Derek was in his early 20s. Two other friends also hinted at a man of similar description, although they didn't know his name, saying that Peggy had mentioned a 24-year-old man who she'd been dating but didn't want to see anymore. She said that he'd been calling her and even stopped by the apartment at the end of January, which is when she told him that she was ending things. Pretty much everyone said that she'd been expressing concern about somebody that she'd been recently dating. One of Peggy's good friends was a man called Timothy Matthews, who often stayed at her place after a night of drinking rather than going home. He was interviewed by investigators, as was pretty much everyone in Peggy's life, and he told them that one night he was staying at Peggy's when a young man he'd never met showed up at the door. She told Timothy to lock the door because she didn't want to have to talk to him. 
Descriptions of this man, Derek, were pretty consistent between those who had seen him. He was in his 20s, between 5'10 and 6 foot, with a heavy build. His hair was on the longer side for a man and was either blonde, reddish blonde, or brown, which is zero help whatsoever. Despite multiple interviews and surveillance operations of both the Laughing Dog and the Prime Minister, the police were never able to actually track down this man, Derek, and find his identity. So to this day, Derek remains a mystery. As the police continued investigating the case, it was concluded that Peggy's killer stabbed her as she walked along the road, most likely from behind, and they picked her up underneath the arms and walked backwards they dragged her into the field. This theory was based on the dirt caked in the gaps between the heel and the soles of Peggy's boots, which seemed unnatural to accumulate if somebody was walking forwards, and the furrows cut into the soil in the field. But marks from Peggy's shoes didn't seem to be the only ones found in that field. There were other prints likely from the killer. They found 28 footprints in total, five directly along the drag trail and three others a few feet to the north of where Peggy's body was found. It seems that despite the meandering path the killer took whilst deciding where to place Peggy, they then walked straight out of the field and back onto the path. The police took this investigation very seriously from the beginning and they did do quite a good job at first, which is something that you hear surprisingly rarely in unsolved true crime cases. I mean, I suppose these cases often remain unsolved for a reason. But it's a shame that I can't say the police work was always good in this case because it definitely wasn't as you'll find out. They took careful measurements and close up photos of these footprints, drawing elaborate diagrams of the field showing where each footprint was found. 12 of the shoe prints had the same pattern, the bottom of the sole appearing to have small lines running all the way across the print, as well as a small oval trademark with a brand name on the bottom of the shoe. The footprints were 11 to 12 inches long, approximately a size 8.5 to 9. So over the next few weeks, investigators visit a number of stores around Fort Collins in an attempt to identify the brand of this particular shoe. And eventually they found the shoe they were looking for at the Tom McCann store in Foothills Fashion Mall. It was a men's dress shoe, which was unexpected as you would expect it to be some kind of trainer or casual shoe. I don't know how dressy the bars were in this area, but to me this suggests that this could have been potentially someone who followed Peggy home from the bar. We've already talked about most of the belongings Peggy had on her when she was found, but there's one thing I haven't mentioned that just adds a whole other layer of mystery to the story. On the 2nd of January 1987, just a month before she was murdered, she went to the Fort Collins police station to report a missing bracelet. She had gone to the Laughing Dog on New Year's Eve and at some point lost a gold bracelet, a family heirloom worth about $700. The weird thing is though that Peggy was actually wearing this bracelet when her body was found. Now of course there could be a simple explanation for this, maybe she found it and just hadn't got around to letting the police station know. Or maybe whoever killed her happened to be the one who stole it and put it back on her body. It's something that we'll probably never know the answer to. It didn't take long for the police to come up with their first, and I suppose last, suspect in this case, and it was not the mysterious Derek. It was actually a 15 year old boy who was brought to the attention of the police by his own father. On the same morning Peggy was found, Clyde Masters told the investigators in the area that his 15 year old son, Timothy Masters, had walked through the field where Peggy's body would soon be found, about 6.55 am that morning. Clyde said that he'd watched him walk along his usual route to the school bus where he suddenly veered west off the path, looking at something for a few seconds before going on to catch the bus. And this concerned the police, it concerned them that Tim had actually been the first one to see the body about five minutes before the cyclist and had failed to report it. So at about 10am that same morning, a detective goes to Tim's school to question him, to which Tim says that he had seen the body that morning but believed it to be a mannequin, that someone was playing a sick joke on him. He said it had been bothering him all morning. But because Tim failed to report this body straight away, he headed to the top of the investigation suspect list. One of the investigators on this case was Fort Collins Detective Lieutenant James Broderick, who seemed to zone in on Masters very, very early on. Over the next few days, Tim would be interrogated by police for over 12 hours. It seems like his father had to give his consent as Tim was a minor, but Clyde was actually present in the room as he was being interrogated. Later footage showed Tim repeatedly insisting his innocence whilst the police repeatedly insisted that they knew he'd committed the murder. He took part in a lie detector test after hours of interrogation and the results were found to be inconclusive. Teachers would later say that Tim was just a normal kid with no violent tendencies. The master's home was searched and investigators found a number of things that they said they found concerning. Tim had a knife collection, one with a scalpel hidden in the handle, and a large amount of stories and drawings that investigators classed as war and horror productions. 
2,200 pages in total to be exact. I'm not going to lie to you, these drawings are concerning. They were weird, they depicted murder and suicide and creepy faces and weapons and weird characters. I'm sure editing me is pasting some on the screen for you to look at right now. The question you've got to ask though is whether or not these creepy drawings would make the same teenage boy capable of murder, or if this is just something typical of teenage boys in the midst of puberty. It's probably not entirely normal behaviour to doodle things like this, but it's probably also not completely out of the ordinary. These drawings depict people of all sexes, all ages and genders, all races. But women were actually depicted as victims in these drawings less than 10% of the time. As well as this, investigators also found a copy of the local newspaper that contained the account of Peggy's murder on his dresser. However, despite all of this odd circumstantial evidence, investigators found no trace of Peggy's hair or blood anywhere in the house, including on the knife collection, which you would have thought would be the murder weapon. There was zero physical evidence. Because of this, Tim Masters was not arrested for the crime, despite investigators being convinced that he was the guilty party, this 15-year-old boy. So, on the one-year anniversary of Peggy's murder, the Fort Collins police executed an elaborate plan in an attempt to elicit a response from Tim, hoping to catch him out. They planted an article in the local newspaper, suggesting they had a strong suspect in the murder, and then made sure that this newspaper was delivered to the master's home. They then maintained round-the-clock surveillance on him, on the crime scene and on Peggy's grave. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure what outcome they wanted to get from this. Perhaps they thought that Tim would panic and do something stupid, try and get rid of evidence or maybe do the classic serial killer thing and go and revisit the scene of the crime. But whatever they were hoping for, it didn't happen. But this didn't mean that Broderick was any less convinced that Masters was the perpetrator. In fact, he just seemed to become more convinced. For years, Tim Masters remained at the top of the suspect list, until the 28th of July 1992, when a judge is finally convinced to sign an arrest warrant. The key pieces of evidence leading to this arrest were the fact that Tim saw Peggy's body and didn't report it, his violent drawings and writings, his knives, and statements that he apparently made after the fact. It was discovered that Tim had apparently told his high school friends details about the sexual mutilations on Peggy. And this was information that at the time had not been made public, nor had it been told to Tim or his attorneys. Only the killer would know such details. So Tim's taken in and the detectives interview him, and they soon realise there's big gaping holes in their case and decide not to arrest him. It later turned out that a friend in Tim's art class had been the one to tell him about the mutilations. This said friend had been a part of the Explorer Scouts helping the police search the crime scene and they'd been told about the mutilations then. So this friend then told Tim and Tim told other people. Everything about his story checked out here. Already for five years, the murder of Peggy Hetrick had been hanging over Tim Masters. From the ages of 15 to 20, he had been the lead suspect in a brutal murder case. All throughout his school years and him leaving and getting a job, he was interviewed periodically by the police, never finding anything. But still, Broderick refused to believe that he wasn't the guilty party. In October 1996, Broderick consults with a former FBI agent who was an expert in sexual homicides. And in June 1996, he begins consulting with a forensic psychologist called Dr. J. Reed Malloy from California, who theorised that Tim had planned and rehearsed Peggy's murder, that the clues were all in his writings and drawings. Malloy said that some of the drawings represented Tim reliving his crimes. The following year, on August 10th, 1998, over 10 years after the murder, Timothy Masters was finally arrested in California and charged with the first degree murder of Peggy Hetrick. He'd been honourably discharged from the Navy by this point and was just relaxing in his home when he'd got a knock on the door and Jim Broderick walked into his house and arrested him. Over the years, they said they'd looked at other suspects and ruled each of them out one by one, including Peggy's boyfriend, Matt Zollner, and multiple known sex offenders in the area. They said they'd done that, whether they had, is up for debate. Masters was apparently the only viable suspect left. Despite having spent the last few years working for the military, learning how to become an aircraft mechanic, he never had a single discipline problem within the military, nor did he have any violent offences under his belt. But apparently, because he only lived 100 feet away from where Peggy had been found, he had the opportunity to commit this murder. Broderick believed that Tim could have spotted Peggy from his bedroom window, crawled out and attacked her. But what was the motive behind this all? Well, that's where these weird drawings come into the picture. 
Investigators were convinced they were a look into the dark mind of Timothy Masters, that they showed that he was a messed up kid and capable of such a crime. Actually, almost all of the arresting paperwork was based on Dr. Reed Malloy's analysis of Tim's juvenile writings and drawings. Malloy was sure that even in the years following the murder, Tim would have continued doodling and writing, so the police get another search warrant and seize more notebooks. Turns out they were right, there were more drawings. But did this actually mean anything? Apparently so, because all of this was submitted as evidence at the trial, which began on the 18th of March 1999. The jury were overwhelmed with drawings and writings referred to as productions, both from before Peggy's murder and in the years after, things that he'd drawn in his adult years. One of the drawings was interpreted by the prosecution as a knife cutting into a vagina, although Tim insisted that it was just a knife cutting into an object, it was never intended to be anything. Teachers at Tim's high school apparently stated that as many as four-fifths of their students drew violent drawings. It didn't necessarily have to mean anything. Dr Malloy's theories surrounding this case were pretty much the prosecution's entire case at trial. He was the expert witness, and according to Dr Malloy, Tim imagined himself as a warrior who killed many people, without empathy or feeling. He had this theory of displaced matricide, because Tim's mother had died four years before Peggy's murder, also on February 11th, when he was just 11 years old. In a nutshell, this theory goes that Tim was mad at his mother for dying, so to celebrate the death anniversary, he waited for a woman to walk past with red hair like his mother's and killed her. By doing so, he had symbolically killed his own mother. There was a big gaping hole in this theory though, because his mother never had red hair, his mother's hair was brown. The state claimed that Tim purposely picked out Peggy Hetrick as his victim, that he left his bedroom that morning through the screen window, and took with him his survival knife, his scalpel, and his red covered flashlight. He surprised her and came up on her from behind, and thrust the knife deep into her back. He lowered her to the curb, dragged her to the field, and partially disrobed her and removed her nipple and vaginal skin. Footprints in the field showed that he stopped within six feet of Peggy on his way to the bus the next morning, apparently characteristic of murderers returning to the scene of the crime. The wounds were consistent with Tim's knives and they were sharp enough to perform such cuttings. The fact that he was an artist is apparently what allowed him to be so accurate in his cuts, according to the prosecution. The bloodstains in the area were found to be consistent with the police's theory here. In the end, Tim was convicted and sentenced to life in prison for the murder, despite some jurors having doubts about his guilt. The case of Peggy Hetrick was now solved, people could now sleep well again in Fort Collins, but many people still had their doubts, including people on the police force it seems. Many people were aware of Broderick's one-track mind for this case. Most people didn't believe it would be possible that such a young boy could have pulled off such a sophisticated killing, especially such a fetish-based killing. This murder was sexually motivated, there's no two ways about that. By the end of the 90s, DNA analysis had made leaps and bounds, but of course it was nowhere near as sophisticated as it is nowadays, but it was certainly a lot better than it was back in the late 80s when Peggy was killed. They had the means at this time in 1999 to test DNA and find skin cells and particles on crime scene specimens. It was something that was regularly done at this time. The police had Peggy's clothes from the murder, they had her black coat, her shoes, her blouse, panties, socks and jeans, but it was never tested. The prosecution focused all of their energy on the psychological analysis of Tim and his drawings rather than the physical evidence that may have been available to them at the time. But let's go back a little bit and look at 1992. A woman called Linda Wheeler had been working as a detective on this case since the beginning and in 92 was appointed lead investigator on the case. Back in 1987, she'd be convinced other suspects should be a major focus here, that they shouldn't just be focusing on masters. She believed an FBI profile of the killer should be developed, but her supervisors wouldn't allow it. When Broderick at one point told her that masters had been on the verge of cracking during interrogation, she watched back seven whole hours of tape. She said that she just didn't see any deceptive behaviour. She has said of Broderick, he was fixated, just fixated on masters. He was fitting facts to the hypothesis. That's not how it's supposed to work. She said as time went on, she became less and less comfortable with the idea of masters as the main suspect here. And she told the district attorney of her concerns, but it seems they didn't pay much attention. By 1995, she'd left to become an agent with the CBI and Masters went on to be arrested and convicted. 
the CBI being the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. So almost immediately after his conviction, Tim Masters made an appeal to the Colorado Court of Appeals on the grounds that his drawings were inadmissible under the rules of the court, as was some of the testimony at trial, including that of Dr. Malloy. The court unanimously upheld his conviction though in February 2001. In 2002, the Colorado Supreme Court granted review to determine whether evidence eliciting Tim's supposed violent nature was improperly admitted. They found that yes, some of the evidence presented at trial should have been suppressed, but the court determined this error was harmless and just affirmed the previous findings. So once again, the guilty verdict was just upheld four to three, with four justices saying that the trial proceedings followed the rules, whilst three of them called the trial grossly unfair. That's very close. One justice even wrote in the dissent, most of these writings and drawings have nothing to do with this grisly murder. The sheer volume of the inadmissible evidence so overwhelmed the admissible evidence that the defendant could not have had a fair trial. There exists a substantial rise that the defendant was convicted not for what he did, but for who he was. Regardless of this, a petition was denied for rehearing the case. Tim was stuck in jail. But he wasn't about to give up because in 2004 he started another appeal, this time on the grounds of ineffective counsel. In response, the state appointed a new defence team who immediately began looking into the case with a fresh set of eyes. By this point, he'd already served five years at Buena Vista Prison in the Rocky Mountains. The state appointed a new defence attorney, Maria Lu, to represent Masters in this new case. She was very well versed in juvenile crimes and it was something she focused on a lot. And she, as with anyone new who looked at this case, was surprised that he'd been convicted on the basis of just a few doodles. And then she heard that Linda Wheeler, who was the lead investigator at one point, had doubts herself about his guilt. Maria decided that Tim needed to be freed, so she took the first steps to preserve all evidence in this case, which was weirdly immediately opposed by the DA's office, who said to her that there was no statutory duty to preserve evidence, even in a homicide case, and Colorado law had no requirement that evidence be preserved. Luckily for Maria though, and Tim I suppose, most of Peggy's clothing, which was some of the most important evidence in this case, was still in storage. But some important evidence had gone missing over the years, including two hairs that were found on Peggy's shoes, photos of fingerprints that we lifted from a handbag that did not belong to her, and they also lost that gold bracelet, the very same bracelet that she'd reported as missing, and then magically reappeared on her body when it was found. The defence knew that to prove Tim's innocence, they had to go down the DNA route, which was just inexplicably ignored at the last trial. In an effort to collect as much evidence as possible, Maria Lou contacted Fort Collins obstetrician gynaecologist called Dr. Warren James. She showed him the pictures of Peggy's wounds, I'm sure in an effort to become more knowledgeable about the subject herself, but James said he already knew these cuttings, he'd been shown them before. He spoke of what we'd done to Peggy was a partial vulvectomy, something that required a high degree of surgical skill and high grade surgical instruments. It couldn't have been done without good lighting and placing Peggy's legs in a frog position. James said that it was highly unlikely an untrained 15 year old boy could perform such a precise surgical procedure so neatly. He said that even he would have difficulty performing the procedure under the circumstances of Peggy's death. The implications of this were huge and important because not only did it mean that Tim was probably innocent, it meant that the crime scene could potentially be somewhere else entirely and the field was just the dumping ground. She may have been abducted, taken to a room with bright lighting and then taken to be dumped in the field. It also quickly turned out that one professional at the time of the original investigation had stated his opinion that he thought that the blood spatter at the scene was likely evidence of being a dump site for the body rather than the location of the stabbing. That her dead body may have been dropped off from a car at that site and then dragged into the centre of the field. Even in the original police reports, the medical examiner called the wounds surgical. And something else that neglected to be mentioned in the original trial is that some of the autopsy photos revealed that Peggy's body seemed to have been washed after death with evidence of sponge lines. And another important piece of evidence potentially showing Tim's innocence is that he weighed less than Peggy. He was a 110 pound teenage boy. He probably would not have been able to drag Peggy's body across the field, at least not by himself. So the defense began the process of getting things ready for DNA testing, which isn't quite as easy as just picking up the evidence and sending it to a lab for testing. There's a lot of protocol behind it. 
But it just so happened that around this same time, the deputy prosecutor suddenly decided that they wanted to DNA test the evidence as well, after years of refusing to do so. The DA's office and the Fort Collins police suddenly decided to take the clothing to a CBI lab for their own DNA testing. Just why would they suddenly decide to do that now? Are they suddenly panicking? The defense team was so furious about everything here that they attempted to make a motion to disqualify the Latimer County DA's office from the case for deliberately attempting to destroy exculpatory evidence in violation of court orders and in violation of Timothy Masters' constitutional rights. For years, the DA's office had consistently made moves to stonewall and block the defense team from doing anything in this case. So soon, the Adams County DA, Don Quick, took over. Around this same time, the blood spatter analyst who said that the blood at the scene matched the investigator's theory that Peggy had been stabbed as she walked down the road was showed a whole load of new crime scene photos that he'd never been shown before. It changed his entire opinion on this case. His original conclusion had been manufactured by the investigators on this case. He was shown only carefully selected pieces of evidence to support the fabrication that Tim Masters was responsible here. With all this new information supplied to him in 2007, he announced an entirely different opinion, that the best explanation was that Peggy was attacked in another location and then transported to the field, ruling out Tim Masters as the culprit. He was 15, he didn't have a car. It's thought that a similar thing happened with Dr. Malloy as well, that the investigators carefully selected a discreet set of evidence to share with him in order to manipulate him into concluding that Tim Masters was guilty. Investigators repeatedly informed him that he was being provided with all the relevant documents, but they didn't, they didn't give it all to him. They actually had withheld a huge amount of information pertaining to other potential suspects, other doctor's analyses, all evidence related to an FBI psychological profile, and a transcript or conversation that was secretly taped between Clyde and Tim Masters, in which Tim repeatedly professed his innocence. It was also discovered that Dr. Malloy had been provided with Peggy's obituary and the 1988 bogus article, which he was told had been possessed by Tim Masters. But it turns out that both these items had been planted in his room by the Fort Collins PD. And it turns out the shoe print evidence of the Tom McCann brand shoe prints found at the scene were covered up and lied about at the original trial because these particular shoe prints could not have belonged to Tim Masters. Only one of the 28 shoe prints found in the field was proved to match the tennis shoes Tim was wearing that day. And it makes sense that his prints would have been in the field because we all know that he definitely walked through there every day to get to the school bus. The defence team got to work with trying to extract some DNA from the remaining evidence, whatever hadn't already been destroyed by the Colorado Bureau of Investigation or the Fort Collins Police. Whilst DNA not belonging to Peggy was found on the clothes, none of it was found to belong to Tim. But in the interior lining of Peggy's pants, as in knickers, not trousers, they found a full genetic profile belonging to an unknown man. It was exactly where the defence team predicted the killer's fingers would have curled to pull the pants down. And as well as having no skin cell DNA that matched him, the fingerprints found on Peggy's bag and the hairs found on her clothing also did not belong to him. But of course, FCPD lost those fingerprints and hairs, making it impossible to compare them to other suspects. On the 23rd of August 2007, Judge Joseph Weatherby begins a series of hearings in the fight for a new trial. This was at the same time the defence team were extracting all of this DNA. There was also DNA found, of course, that belonged to her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Matt Zollner. And all of this was confirmed by the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. Just four days later, Weatherby signs an order to free Tim Masters on bail to be released immediately. And then proceedings started to decide whether to retry him or simply drop all charges. And the Larimer County District Attorney, Larry Abrahamson, files a motion to dismiss all charges, but stresses that he had not been exonerated for the crime. So in 2008, Tim Masters had been released. And shortly after this release, he filed a federal civil rights lawsuit against Fort Collins Police and Larimer County prosecutors. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? It was filed against prosecutors Terry Gilmore and Jolene Blair, detectives James Broderick and Marsha Reed, and the chief of the FCPD, Dennis Harrison, and others, alleging violations of Tim's civil rights. I'm going to leave a PDF in the description box of the official complaint file. It's literally 82 pages detailing everything that went wrong with this case. I've already covered a significant amount of it throughout this video, but just to share part of the complaint verbatim with you. It reads, the defendant systematically fabricated probable cause to arrest Mr. Masters for the murder of Peggy Hetrick. 
To do so, each defendant in various ways had to conspire, encourage, allow acquiescing, supervise and or participate in one or more of the following. 1. The calculated suppression and destruction of massive amounts of clearly exculpatory evidence. 2. The manufacturing and orchestration of significant and obviously false inculpatory evidence. 3. The perpetual lying to and misleading of experts, judges, defence counsel and Mr Masters. And 4. A long term and wide reaching conspiracy to ensure that Tim Masters was arrested, tried and convicted for the murder of Miss Hetrick, in despite of the great and obvious weight of evidence supporting his innocence. The document speaks about how even when Tim's defence counsel began to uncover all this, the SCPD and 8th Judicial District went to great lengths to protect their reputations, even though such protections meant the continued jailing of an apparent innocent man. I would highly recommend going to read the document if you've got time, it's very eye-opening. Eventually, in February 2010, Larimer County agreed to pay Tim $4.1 million to settle the lawsuit. In June of the same year, the city of Fort Collins agreed to pay $5.9 million. Does $10 million make up for 10 years of your life lost to prison? Probably not. But something that might make up for it is somebody else actually paying for what they did. In June 2010, a grand jury indicted James Broderick on eight counts of perjury, accusing him of repeatedly lying in affidavits and in court. Great news. But then in May 2011, a judge dismissed all of the charges, citing the statute of limitations. So he never paid. Finally, on June 28, 2011, the Colorado Attorney General stated that Tim Masters was no longer a suspect in Peggy Hetrick's murder and had officially been exonerated. He said, Pursuant to the mandate from the governor's office, our team undertook a comprehensive review of the entire Hetrick homicide. Our team conducted more than 170 interviews and conducted further DNA analysis. Throughout the past year, the statewide grand jury heard evidence and testimony from numerous witnesses. Based on the testimony, the forensic analysis and the crime scene analysis, the overwhelming conclusion is that Timothy Masters was not involved in the murder of Peggy Hetrick. He went on to say that Tim cooperated fully with the investigation and that Peggy's case remained open. They'd made significant progress in the investigation, apparently. And then, exactly a month after this, Broderick was re-indicted on nine counts of perjury, facing up to six years in prison, if each of those counts was convicted. Those charges were also soon dismissed. There was an internal investigation at the FCPD, at least looking into how he handled this investigation, but that was suspended after Broderick resigned in 2013. All charges against him were finally dismissed in 2013, so there's been no payback here, nothing. This guy has never paid. With all of this going on, it's easy to forget the true and original victim of this case was poor Peggy Hetrick. Her case is still open and it doesn't seem like anyone is any closer to solving it. Perhaps if they'd actually investigated properly at the start and not just focused all of their resources on Tim, they might have got an answer. And you're probably thinking the obvious, that Matt Zollner, the on-again, off-again boyfriend, is the obvious suspect. Of course, this has been looked into, his DNA was found on Peggy's clothing, but that doesn't particularly mean much in this case, because if they were in a relationship and they had seen each other on the night in question, it would be expected that his DNA would be found on her clothes. Especially considering that multiple witnesses said they saw them hug and kiss at the bar that night. He was initially considered a suspect, but was quickly ruled out. The girlfriend he was with that night gave him an alibi, saying that she stayed with him until at least 3am, probably 3.30am, and the likelihood is that Peggy was already dead by that point. Experts estimate that she died shortly after leaving the pub, so probably around half one, two o'clock. Although there is evidence to suggest Peggy was upset with Matt for being out with another woman that night, and they may have had a fight, this doesn't necessarily mean that he killed her. I could be totally wrong, of course, but my gut just tells me that Matt probably didn't have anything to do with this, but you can make your own decision there. But there does seem to be a suspect that fits much better than both Matt and Tim. A man called Dr. Richard Hammond, a prominent eye surgeon in the area who lived about 250 yards east of where Peggy's body had been found, about the same distance away than the master's house was. In 1995, a college student was house-sitting for him and his family whilst they were on holiday, where she heard a strange noise coming from the basement bathroom. It was a techie, electrical kind of sound. She followed the strange noise to a vent by the toilet and looked inside and found a camera lens. She had a look around and found a huge amount of pornography, close-ups of women sitting on the toilet and their genitalia, including his own family members. 
The police were obviously alerted and soon raided the house, confiscating everything. They found other cameras in the same bathroom and another in the spare bedroom. They found lists cataloguing the hundreds of tapes, including the names and ages of the victims, the number of times each had been taped and notes concerning the details of their genitals. When Hammond returned from his holiday with the family, he was arrested in sexual exploitation charges and his family were shocked. This was a polite and professional man, the father of two teenage children who I think were girls. And he was a great surgeon. According to several FCPD detectives who were at the Hammond crime scene, he was immediately discussed as a possible suspect in Peggy's murder. It was so close to the spot where she'd been found, you could see it from the upstairs main bedroom window. He also had a very obvious obsession with female genitalia and had surgical abilities. Upon arrest, he was taken immediately to a hospital and didn't spend any time in jail. I'm honestly not sure why he was taken to hospital instead of jail. And prosecutor Terry Gilmore, the same Gilmore who was named in Tim's civil suit, got Hammond's immediate release from custody. Turns out they were friends through the church. Hammond ended up committing suicide nearly a week after his arrest and just before doing so, shaved his entire body, including his genitals, ensuring there was no trace evidence left behind. There wasn't a single hair on his body. Why would he do this? In February 1987, shortly after Peggy's murder, the Behavioural Science Unit of the FBI told the FCPD that the culprit in her murder was likely a voyeur. There's no denying that's what Hammond was. In fact, according to psychological records, he had been an admitted and diagnosed sexual voyeur since he was a teenager. So the police are looking for a voyeur in Peggy's murder, and one lives 250 yards away, but instead they look to the weedy teenage boy with no criminal or sexual history. According to a police report of an incident on February 24th, 1987, shortly after the Hetrick murder, a man closely resembling Dr. Hammond made stabbing motions with an ice core at a female employee of the Prime Minister, the bar at which Peggy was last seen. The employee, like Peggy, was red-haired. The perpetrator closely resembled Dr. Hammond in physical build, stature and age. And then another police report dated 17th of April 1987, a man closely resembling Dr. Hammond exposed his genitals and had a partial erection whilst walking by the location of Peggy's crime scene. A female witness of this later told an investigator that a mugshot of Dr. Hammond looked just like the perpetrator of this. And it later turned out that Hammond had taken the day off work on February 11th, 1987, when Peggy's body was clearly visible from his upstairs window, the same day she died. Tim Masters had gone to school as usual that day, and Dr. Hammond had access to a car, Tim Masters did not. I'm not saying here for sure that Richard Hammond committed Peggy's murder, but I'm saying there's a hell of a lot more circumstantial evidence here to point towards it being him, rather than the incredibly loose evidence some disturbing doodles they used to convict Tim Masters. Strangely, everyone involved in this case refused to ever consider Hammond a suspect. Now, we've already covered that prosecutor Terry Gilmore had a personal connection with Hammond, and therefore he had a significant conflict of interest. But interestingly, Gilmore actually sought to obtain a court order, which authorised having the physical evidence in the Hammond case burnt in a 55-gallon drum only a few months after his death because according to him, it no longer had any evidentiary value. By this point, the FCPD had barely been able to scratch the surface of the home tapes he had made. Could there have potentially been something in there that connected him to the death of Peggy Hetrick? Apparently, a lot of FCPD detectives were shocked when they learned that the Hammond evidence had been destroyed so quickly, when typically evidence was kept in storage for several years. I would really love to know the reason why Gilmore was so determined to get this evidence destroyed. Did he know something? Was he trying to protect someone? Or did he and others have personal vendetta against the Masters family? Let's move on to another possible suspect here in the form of Donald Long, an admitted murderer in the area. Within a nine month period in 1987, three women in the 30s were fatally stabbed in the back in the Fort Collins Greeley area. Peggy, Linda Holt and Mona Hughes. Weirdly, all of their surnames began with an H. 39-year-old Linda Holt was an accountant who disappeared from her office on the 18th of March 1987. Her body was found a week later, stabbed numerous times and propped against a tree at Black Hollow Reservoir in Weld County. 20-year-old Mona Hugh picked up a hitchhiker after she got off work on the 7th of November 1987. This hitchhiker just happened to be Donald Long. Her body was found three weeks later in a storage shed northeast of Greeley. She'd been stabbed 14 times and had been robbed of $130. 
Donald Long admitted to the murders of Linda and Mona, and in 1987, a report was drafted that potentially linked him to Peggy's murder as well. He was listed as one of 94 potential suspects in her case. However, no one ever posed a single question to Long regarding his possible involvement in Peggy's murder, and he obviously never confessed to it. Linda Wheeler, who eventually took the lead in Peggy's case, like I said, asked her supervisor if she could investigate Donald Long in relation to Peggy's murder, and was simply told that he'd been eliminated as a suspect. She wasn't allowed to talk to him. And then again in 1993, Gilmore authorised the release and destruction of all evidence in the Donald Long case. And I couldn't find any super recent details about Long's connection to the case, but an article from the Greeley Tribune in 2008 stated that Linda Wheeler wouldn't rule out checking DNA samples against those found on Peggy. 12 years later though, and there doesn't seem to be any new updates in regards to this. If Long was guilty of Peggy's murder, she would have been his first victim, although the obvious hole in this theory is that he lacked the surgical skill to take off her nipple and her genitals, and showed no further need to dismember any of his other victims' genitalia. He took two guilty pleas and received two life sentences plus 100 years. He's not eligible for parole until the 11th of July, 2113. And the final potential suspect here is a man called Scott Kimball, a convicted serial killer from Boulder County, Colorado. He is currently serving a 70 year sentence after being found guilty of the murders of four people. Casey McLeod, Jennifer McComb, Leanne Emery, and his own uncle, Terry Kimball. He killed all four victims whilst he was on supervised release from prison after a prior check fraud conviction. He had actually been released as an FBI informant and he began killing pretty soon after this. He has bragged about killing many, many more people which are all unconfirmed. Federal investigators spent a lot of time trying to determine if he did start killing earlier and whether or not he could have been responsible for Peggy's murder, but there doesn't really seem to be much there. The main connection here comes from the fact that he was also the prime suspect in the murder of a woman called Katrina Powell from October 2004, who was beaten, strangled and mutilated. Katrina's murderer severed her hands and she was savagely beaten, which is very different from Peggy's single stab wound. But there was one huge similarity. Katrina's murderer sliced off one of her nipples and cut tissue in her groin. And in 1987, Kimball is proven to have spent time in Fort Collins, although his whereabouts on the exact day Peggy was killed remains a mystery. He was known to hang out around the area that Peggy was found as well. In August 1987, he was ticketed on a harassment charge just half a mile down the road. It's often theorised that he too was obsessed with female genitalia and he's often bragged about his murders, so maybe it was him. But Peggy's case remains cold. It seems that investigations are still ongoing, but realistically, this many years after her death, it's gonna get harder and harder to solve. I hope now that investigators are actually working on solving the case rather than railroading somebody into prison, that they might actually find something. Broderick seemed to have a complete tunnel vision with this case. He wanted Masters to be guilty, and so he was. Peggy never really seemed to be the focal point here, which is a tragedy all in itself. I have a feeling this video has been really long. I've been talking for literally hours, so if you've made it to this point, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you click that subscribe button if you like what I'm doing over here, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.